everybody. Um, good afternoon, um, welcome, and thank you for attending this session. Um, I'm Dale Robertson, I work for JISC in the UK, um, and I'm also the task leader of um, task 2.3 of EOS Hub, which is the governance and sustainability task. Um, next slide, please. So just to have a quick look at the objectives for this session, I'll just clear my screen so I can actually see. There we are. Um, so the idea is to share some experiences in provision and consumption of services across borders and discuss some of the issues that have already been encountered by people with experience of this, but also to collect some audience input uh, from you um, as a contribution towards uh, the ongoing work that we have in this area within the, the EOS Hub project. Uh, next slide, please. So we've got what looks like a very busy agenda and I hope it will be very interesting for you. We've got um, a brief introduction from me to give you some, some scene setting, um, followed by three 10 minute presentations and then a panel session uh, during which of course you have the opportunity to, to offer your questions and comments. Um, next slide, please. Some brief housekeeping. The main thing that I wanted to say was um, that what I'd like to try to do by way of organisation for this session is um, to use the Zoom chat only for technical issues and to use Slido for Q&A, so for your questions and for your comments relating to the actual subject matter of the session. So if you can go to Slido, which I hope is becoming pretty familiar to you by now, um, put in the code, the EOS Hub week code and then select in the drop down um, this session so 19th of May issues in cross border etc okay and also what you can do if you want to raise a question you should also have the ability to use the the raise hand feature in zoom okay next slide please so briefly um, before um, moving on to our presentations um, I wanted to just give you, um, I've got a couple of slides here that just try to give you some background by way of context to explain a little bit about um, the work that's been going on in EOSC Hub um, and to, to just give you the context of, of um, the reason for holding this session really. Um, so um, within EOSC Hub, there's some joint work currently going on actually with um, Work Package 12, uh, which is led by Sergio Andriozzi from EGI. Um, if I roll back though to nearly a year ago, last summer, um, the EOSC Hub project published proposals um, about the Federating Core, about its organisation and contents. And I should explain that in those proposals, um, the Federating Core was proposed not just as the back end non researcher facing elements of the EOSC that were essential for its functioning, but in addition, something that we called shared resources, which were um, services, um, a subset of value added services that we felt were actually essential in order to, to deliver the value add um, to users that the, and, and to providers that the EOSC needs. So in the proposals um, that we published last year, um, the proposals included sustainability of the EOSC and we proposed that the delivery cost of the capabilities of the Federating Core shall be sustained by EOSC funding. In other words, the EOSC should sustain the costs of providing the benefits of open data policies to a wider community of users. Therefore, the EOSC, the EOSC needs to create the financial vehicle to cover the costs of the core, including provision and consumption of what we called EOSC shared resources beyond their originating communities. A very important corollary of that then was that the coordinated provisioning and funding of the Federating Core is expected to bring economies of scale by aligning investments from member states with the compensation of the marginal costs associated with cross-border usage of depletable resources and services. And it's this issue highlighted in the blue box at the bottom of this slide that is really the, the focus of the work that is now kicking off within TAS 2.3 jointly with Work Package 12 within EOSC Hub and which is the, the focus really of the discussion today as well. Um, so next slide please Iris. Next slide please. So I'll carry on talking 
um, whilst the next slide appears. Um, so on the next slide, there, there are actually a couple of examples of what we call shared resources. And it's important um, to emphasize, please don't focus too much on terminology. Um, there's obviously a little bit of a problem with the slides. I'll, I'll keep going anyway, because I'm sure that will get resolved. Um, so what I wanted to do was to give you examples of what we had called shared resources. So in other words, examples of these types of services that would provide value add, um, but for which I think it's necessary for us to figure out what the, um, what the business model would be for their provision. So I put two examples into um, my slides. Um, the first one is um, high performance European distributed cloud storage. Um, sorry, cloud storage environments for secure access, staging, downloading, and deposition of large volumes of data across national, institutional, and research infrastructure boundaries. The second example is high performance and high throughput distributed compute capabilities for big data processing and analysis, including simulations. So, I think these examples are quite familiar to you and I think they're the sorts of services that um, have already got some experience. There obviously are examples of them being provided in a federated form already. Um, so I think this is the, very much the territory that we need to dig some more into. So um, as I've said, we've got some work that's really in its early stages just now in EOSC Hub um, examining possible collaboration scenarios, um, analysing how the EOSC might successfully support fulfilment. Um, so what we're doing, in fact, is we're trying to simulate um, negotiations between users, so use cases, and suppliers who would potentially be able to supply in respond in response to the use cases. We're we're um, in the process of organising workshops to try to um, simulate negotiations between the user side and the supplier side in order to identify what the issues would be with. Um, trying to satisfy these use cases and actually achieve fulfillment and where possible actually identify possible solutions um, which would help to overcome the issues that we identify. So early days at the moment, we don't have any results. We haven't conducted the workshops yet. That work begins, um, gets underway next week. Um, but that's the, the context against which this session is taking place. And I just wanted to explain all that to you um, at the start so that you knew kind of essentially where where this session is coming from so that's it from me thank you um, now we move on to um, three short presentations from our, our invited presenters um, the first of those is from Ilya Levinson um, who's from Estonia so I'll give you a brief introduction of, of Ilya while the slides are set up um, so Ilya um, works at the University of Tartu and is a specialist in cloud solutions. Um, at the moment, he's working in the EOS Nordic project where he leads Work Package 3, which concentrates on services and service providers. And he'll explain a little more about that, I think, in his um, presentation. He also acts as an architect of the Estonian government cloud and Estonian scientific computing e-infrastructure. So um, I will hand on to Ilya. Hi, thank you for the introduction and the opportunity. Uh, so um, I wanted to discuss a bit uh, or present uh, our experience in uh, figuring out what it takes in order to actually start using services across the border with a lower overhead uh, than we saw so far. Um, next slide, please. Just a bit of background about the EOSC Nordic projects, uh, project for those that uh, are not uh, Aware of that, this is essentially a regional project uh, with uh, a somewhat healthy representation of different stakeholders, meaning both service providers and uh, governing bodies and the infrastructures, national infrastructures from uh, all the Nordic countries. Uh, it uh, also is a uh, quite friendly project, so we don't have much politics and we are working towards uh, making it possible to achieve the goals of the EOSC. Uh, next slide, please. A bit of history is that before the EOS Nordic project started, there was a different activity funded by uh, Nordic Infrastructure Collaboration, or NIC, called uh, Dillinger, 
which ran over several years and then uh, was concentrating exactly on uh, the same topic. And that is how to enable, not even enable, but how to uh, simplify the collaboration across the borders. What are the issues and opportunities that come from uh, the fact that services are being more open? Uh, the experience of that project uh, is actually uh, was actually quite important when designing what we want to do within the OSC Nordic. Uh, and most of the partners are actually uh, the same, so we have representations from uh, all the Nordic countries there. Uh, the results are open and you are welcome to visit the link, so this is not uh, so important at the moment, but within the NAIC uh, Dillinger, the scope was uh, relatively uh, small, so we concentrated on uh, essentially figuring out what are the issues when we try to give access to smaller scale HPC projects uh, across the borders. Next slide, please. So basically, the main uh, outcome of the Dillinger was that whenever we're talking about uh, technical issues, they were generally easy to solve. So the amount of time that went into them uh, was quite negligible. The main issue was with uh, aligning of the semantics and uh, organizational aspects of the services when uh, you want to basically offer services across the border. Uh, and that is in a somewhat homogeneous environment in the Nordics. So a lot of time and discussions were spent on figuring out what are the access policies, uh, whether they are published, available, what is the level of assurance that the service provider expects to have uh, for a particular um, organization, what is the impact of sharing resources across the border in terms of the additional uh, value provided and uh, whether it's the subject to, to the VAT law? Uh, what is the motivation in general beyond the project uh, for providing such kind of access, as well as um, reduction of the, like what we need to figure out uh, what is needed in order to reduce the amount of information that the uh, researchers or people that are willing to get access to the services would have needed to provide upfront. So we try to avoid uh, the submission process becoming lengthy and uh, that was basically uh, one of the useful outcomes. So what was clear that we would very much need a certain protocol uh, in order to uh, share services and um, ideally we saw that EOSC would be providing this kind of protocol. Next slide please. So uh, inside EOSC Nordic the part uh, of the uh, project which deals with the services and service providers is essentially split into two uh, main tasks. One task is about uh, essentially mapping and integration of the Nordic uh, service providers within uh, into the EOSC. And the other part, which is uh, probably uh, not less, even perhaps more important, is uh, assuring that the uh, semantical and uh, organizational interoperability of the uh, services and service providers is aligned. So we're not uh, talk, dealing so much with the technical interoperability of the services as we're working with the, um, let's say, semantic and uh, organizational one. Next slide, please. So the reason why we want to have services uh, on the fixed level of maturity is that then it makes it much easier to do some common assumptions or reason about the services. So uh, it's easier to integrate with the EOSC portal. It's easier to explain to the users why this or that is needed. It's easier to make some common assumptions about the services. And basically we decided to have a maturity model as a tool uh, that would allow to um, at least map the service providers and provide them uh, with uh, suggestions uh, as to what is needed in order to make that happen. Uh, the model is actually something that I'm going to present a bit more in details below. Uh, it will be also available uh, later, probably next week, uh, from the uh, ESC Nordic websites, uh, along with exactly exact uh, outcomes for a number of services. Next slide, please. Just to explain a bit uh, where exactly we see that the maturity model fits. 
Now, we are not uh, working uh, with uh, local uh, services on the level of providing them the motivation uh, as to how to participate with, uh, or as to why they should share the services or participate in EOSC. Uh, basically, this is something that the services must decide on their own. What the, the maturity model is uh, helping uh, with is uh, to align uh, more within each country as well as uh, across uh, the border, so inside EOSC, with the common processes and policies that are expected that each service provider would follow. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give you a bit of a understanding as to what extent we went of, for with analysis. So we picked uh, around 50 services of quite different categories from uh, different countries and we ran this uh, analysis for uh, each of them. So for each of the services we basically have a uh, somewhat fine-grained analysis across different uh, categories and attributes and we end up with a certain ranking of the services. Now, the ranking is not intended to be a sort of competition, although, uh, of course, it's uh, a bit of that, but uh, it's intended to uh, help service providers to achieve a level of maturity that is needed to at least be part of EOSC uh, and uh, go beyond that as well. Next slide, please. So the model is designed in a way that, uh, you know, if you achieve the minimal level of uh, the maturity, then this is uh, exactly what is needed to be classified as an EOSC service on the minimal level. Uh, the model is intended to be simple. It's in, we know of the drawbacks and, uh, that come from these simplifications of some aspects, but it's also intended to be uh, feasible uh, to use for a number of heterogeneous services. So this is a sort of say first entry into the uh, EOSC world, so it's something that we intend to provide to the service providers that would like to start uh, working across the borders. Uh, so the model includes several uh, main chapters. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Mm. Not sure for me the slide is still the same, uh, but Yes, I think it looks like the slides are tending to stick at some point, um, Ilya. Um, so if, okay. if you can go on sure. you know, while we uh, try to sort it out. Sure. So basically, uh, we have a somewhat traditional service management part, which is uh, dealing with uh, the level of support uh, for the service provisioning. Uh, however, we also get into the data management and fair data requirements, providing uh, initially a set of small and simple questions to figure out if the service provider at all is aware of the fairness, whether the research data cycle, uh, life cycle has been defined and so, uh, things like that. We also get, and this is something that uh, was quite clear from the uh, Delicia project, we discussed the accessibility and legal requirements in uh, a bit more details. So we are trying to figure out if uh, the service is intended or in general accessible uh, by users outside its original community. If uh, the uh, usage from other European countries is possible at all. So uh, GDPR uh, analysis and limitations, whether the uh, IPR, so the, uh, the, the IP rules are um, clarified for some of the services. So the reason why we ask this question is, is that uh, they have been causing a lot of uh, discussions uh, and essentially wasted time. So we're trying to figure out if we can provide the answers and the best practices uh, ahead of time. Finally, uh, we consider also sustainability of the service, although this has been a, a very complicated question for a number of services. Uh, and uh, also the last uh, and the most complicated one is the compliance with the EOSC architecture. So, so far, majority of the services have uh, all, so to say, no's uh, in, um, in uh, that uh, uh, section, primarily because the relevant documents uh, are not yet published, so it's very hard to uh, evaluate whether the service is um, 
uh, yeah, whether this service is compliant with uh, EOSC uh, regulations or not. So what you see on the last slide is an example of a estimation where uh, service provider is basically saying that they have no clue as to what they need to do in order to be compliant with the EOSC. So, um, yeah, so this is basically the last slide. And uh, what I want to say is that we're going to publish this model uh, that uh, could be seen and used by others as well. Uh, we are uh, running, uh, this is version two by now. So this has been uh, several iterations of that one. We plan to release a newer one at the end of the year once the uh, EOSC um, working group uh, results are published. And we very much hope uh, that uh, over time, this would be essentially a deprecated model. So we will get all the required information uh, from the EOSC itself. So whether it's a service description template or, uh, or something else. So thank you very much. I think I'm semi on time. <laughs> thank you very much, Julia. Um... And I can see um, that there is a question in the, the chat, actually. So I think we've got time for one question at the moment before we move on. Um, so Owen Appleton has asked, um, he said, Nordic collaboration results look very positive and have yielded great results, but can the model be used elsewhere? Would the collaboration be so easy between um, France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, and so on? Um, how do we tackle political and organizational barriers? Um, might be interesting to hear your, your your sort of Nordic perspective on that, perhaps, please, before we move on. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm the correct person to present the whole Nordics. In a sense, I think the, there is a point that uh, the larger you become, uh, the more uh, issues you have uh, with the political aspects, which can be corrosive to, if you want to achieve something. Um, I believe that the correct way forward is essentially figuring out uh, what are the options to increase the trust towards each other so that it would be more synergy than uh, competition in some aspects. Like we're not talking, I mean, Nordic countries also compete uh, and there is, a, there is no question that, uh, that everybody's providing services for free or, or not. The, the only difference I see is that there is a bit less of, uh, like there is a, uh, a habit of understanding uh, other countries' needs and be open about addressing them as well. So uh, I believe that this is a complicated question and uh, it's not uh, technical at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's very diplomatic. <laughs> Okay, well, in the interest of keeping moving forward with, with time, I'll say thank you very much, Ilya, um, for a very interesting presentation. And we'll, we'll move on now to the next presentation, which is from Sai Holsinger, who works for EGI. Um, he's the strategy and innovation team lead and business development manager there. And he's, um, he's got around about 15 years of experience dealing with EU funded projects, um, developing and implementing e infrastructures. Um, also leading commercial exploitation and at the moment he's um, the coordinator for the EOS Digital Innovation Hub as well. Um, so Sai, I'll pass over to you. Okay, I trust you can hear me well and see my screen? Yes, thank you. Right, great, so I'm probably going to come at this with a little bit of different angle which is just kind of looking at um, kind of pay for use style situations and some of the typical let's say processes and documentations and experiences and rationales that um, EGI has experienced over the last couple of years. And I think that there will be most likely some parallels with some of the conversations that will be happening inside of EOSC. And I think that this could be an opportunity to kind of share um, some of our issues and then maybe also some opportunities in the future um, where we can maybe kill multiple birds with one stone. So I am, I'm going to give you just a, I only have 10 minutes, so I'm just going to stick to the highlights here, which is a brief history, not of EGI as a whole, but just of our pay for use activities. What has kind of been some of our work or results to date? Um, a little bit of like a list, a checklist of the types of documentation or agreement or tools that you would either need to think about or to start to put into place. 
Um, and then what are some of the opportunities that we see moving forward? Because obviously it's not a perfect situation at the moment. It's just a, a periodic uh, work in progress, let's say. So back in 2013, basically just a couple years after the AGI Foundation was set up, we kind of started off with an exploratory model of saying, okay, we're a public funded infrastructure. If we wanted to add pay for use um, services uh, or business models into our existing, um, our existing organization, how would that work? Because we would have to basically make sure that we weren't compromising any state aid and competition laws, et cetera. So what we, that kind of got uh, put together, drafted, articulated, approved by the, the AGI Council to kind of move forward with like a kind of a proof of concept. So we kind of started to pull together a number of our different providers from a number of different countries to start to kind of do a deep dive analysis on what this would actually mean within individual organizations. Because the complication here is, is that not only are different policies um, they're different or vary across different countries, but also then between institutes, what they can and cannot do. So we had to start to find out what are these combinations of who can do what and under what circumstances. So one of it was from a policy point of view. The other one was from a tool point of view. So could our existing tools even basically account for the usage um, of those services on a pay for use and be able to calculate out a price and, and eventually a bill. Um, so then we needed to look at some of our other agreements like having service level uh, SLA, service level agreements between, uh, between the different parties. Um, operational level agreements is something that you need to think about in a federated environment. So you have your back end providers uh, all coordinated. And then we kind of started with, okay, we have a baseline documentation. We started to then come up with, let's say, some requests or some use cases, some outside of projects, some inside of projects. And I think that's what basically brings us to the, the kind of variable scenarios by which different models need to be put in place under a different situations. But the, the big question that we were really trying to answer was, after we had, let's say, one single central project that was funding all of, not just the coordination aspects, but the physical infrastructure, once you move away from some large central project and you move into multiple projects and multiple support functions, therefore you have to have multiple models in place. And each of these come with different pros and cons. So just in participating in Horizon 2020 projects, you can find that you either can participate as a beneficiary, which has pros and cons associated to that. You get visibility, local government uh, recognition. But whenever you're coming inside of a project and you think, yeah, yeah I want to bring in an infrastructure that has 250 data centers spread across 40 countries, you blow up their consortium list and they're not super excited about that. So then you think, okay, well, what about using the third party mechanism? This is interesting because basically it reduces the number of beneficiaries, but then your individual providers also start to lose a little bit of visibility. This also forces the projects to already know their existing technical requirements in order for you to be able to do provider selection. So then we've run into models where basically they don't know where the, the, the requirements are. They just allocate a side budget and say, you manage this budget and you identify the providers whenever the requirements come in. So now this is a completely due mechanism uh, that we have to have in place, but it is very, very similar to the types of things that you have to do in order to basically run a pay for use model. In addition to that, you have external requests that are coming from outside of projects. So either EGI is just purely a matchmaker, so there's a single user in a single country. It doesn't make sense for EGI Foundation to play the middleman in that scenario. So we matchmake them to an individual provider in that country. 
But for other cases where you're basically having multiple providers across multiple countries without having some type of central broker in place, then you basically force people to have individual uh, agreements with individual countries. And that doesn't really, uh, doesn't really scale. So in that scenario, what are our pricing models? Can, can the individual providers provide you the pricing? What would be any type of broker fee that we would put on top of it, et cetera, et cetera. So this is basically what we've been trying to use. We've had some opportunities in EC funded projects where we can kind of refine this mechanism. So in the next JOS project, there was between 10 up to 12 pilots now. And this is the scenario where just EGI was allocated some external budget. We would collect the requirements from the individual pilots, do the provider selection, and then um, and then allocate the resources. So you still have to have agreements in place. The providers still need to be able to invoice EGI in order for that to then be an eligible cost with inside of the project. So we were allocated 100K to basically redistribute. So far we've done, uh, uh, we've allocated 60,000 of that to six EGI providers. Um, and something similar to inside of the EOS Hub project through the Digital Innovation Hub, here um, we were restricted to only being able to redistribute any type of funds to consortium members. But again, the model is still the same, collecting requirements, putting agreements into place, making sure that those providers um, have provided you with a cost that you can account for that then you can put inside of your budget and that gets associated to. So this, these two projects were quite nice because it started to kind of help us really kind of dig down into the processes and the procedures and the documentation. This also led to, we had an external request um, through the, the DS and the European Space Agency. Exprevia was the company that was, let's say, the lead contractor, but here the EGI was contracted out to do a, a kind of a proof of concept, a validation of some, uh, some aspects within inside of the DS if it was able to run in multiple providers in multiple countries. So this was a very small contract that was a proof of concept that ran over 12 months, but it ended up being quite successful. And now we've just gotten requested to continue that second contract. <clears throat> the other thing that people can start to think about is just basically monetizing individual services. So for an example, we have the FedSM and ISO 27000 trainings that we offer as in-house courses or open registration courses, which comes with uh, a specific pricing scheme and a specific pricing model. So start to look at um, how can you monetize existing services that you have and then make those available to the rest of uh, your community. So in just terms of documentation in the last two minutes that I have, so we had to basically collect these kind of what we considered letters of intent. So what we needed was a clear statement on the ability and willingness for the individual providers to, to provide pay for use services. So it was their declaration that they were able to participate in such a model. Um, and then also under what conditions would they provide these paid for use services? Because some of them have to offer services free with inside of their country, but then they don't necessarily have to outside of their country. And every single country kind of had their own different policies. So we got that into a statement. Um, you have to be able to collect these service offers from the individual, um, from the individual providers. Um, right now we're tracking this in a Google spreadsheet. It's becoming more and more sophisticated over time, but is this really a long-term solution? Probably not. Now virtual access mechanisms are now being requested, for example, in these EOSC projects. So this gets into how do you, what is your unit cost? What are the units? How do you calculate that cost? So we've come up with some templates for our providers to start filling them in, but this isn't, let's say, as easy as, uh, as it is of just having a template and filling it out. So some support is needed and some additional maturity in that. We need to be a little bit about the selection criteria. So it really can't, it isn't always about who's just the cheapest provider. A lot of times it needs to be better with what is the exact requirements that are needed. So some have higher availability and reliability targets versus others. Um, some just have very specific technical uh, requirements by which maybe only a subset of our providers can fill. 
You do have to have an SLA. So for an example, if EGI is the foundation is the broker, we have the SLA with the end customer. But for each one of our providers on the back end, whether it's in Italy, Spain, France, we have to have an OLA on the back end to make sure that our agreements are aligned. And then we add some type of broker or coordination fee on top of that. So some opportunities moving forward is basically just make, having a pricing tool, increasing our automations. We had some stuff in our EGI accounting portal, but we are looking at how can we have a better collection of the individual pricing from our individual providers. So we're in discussion with some Swiss guys. And this is basically my last slide, which is kind of the lessons learned. So we acknowledge that funding sources is like an issue and we need to basically create diverse opportunities for us to be able to redistribute uh, funds to the EGI providers. So the Horizon 2020 projects are helping with that. Um, we're getting more requests coming in, so we need to kind of increase the automation of it. So the overhead, reducing the overhead of the agreements, um, trying to have clear pricing listing and procedures. Um, Right now, we only have about six providers who are taking full advantage of the pay for use model. So we need to kind of understand how can we scale that out. But right now, not everybody is able to provide invoices, et cetera. So we just kind of want to um, continue to investigate that. And we are now investigating other services that could have a pricing model. So for an example, we're in conversations with two providers around, for example, archive storage and stuff. It's just that since EGI is a public funded uh, organization, we're a non-for-profit, we always have to kind of walk this uh, with this boundary uh, to avoid that VAT charges end up on our council fees. So part of our long-term activities is looking at a potential commercial arm if it becomes interesting. So just a quick little highlight about uh, EGI and our current activities and the pay for use. And with that, I'll stop and then take any, uh, any questions that you may have. Thanks very much, Sai. That was really interesting. Um, so I can see that Rene has asked a question which I really don't think it's possible to give a short answer to. So I'm, I'm going to avoid taking that one now because I think it will come up again during the, the panel discussion. But um, Bob Jones has asked, um, in the pay for use model, what is the legal basis of the service level, service level agreement? What happens in case of a breach of the SLA, such as non-availability of the service, and how is dispute resolution handled? Can you make any sort of relatively brief comments on that? Uh, so basically it's described in the SLA. So every single aspect that he covered is described inside of the SLA. It would take a, a lot to go through every, every bit of that. But um, also some customers have different requirements in terms of basically. So some, I, I just give you one example where we had to say a no is uh, we had um, with the European Space Agency to do a direct contract with them, you would have to be basically, you are fully liable for the exact amount of the, of the contract. So the bigger the contract, the more in which you're liable, which then you need to make a decision over whether or not you are uh, able to accept that number of financial risk. And at one point for one of the large contracts, we just basically had to say no. For others, it's... Um, um, it's more lightweight depending on how it is, but it's all described with inside of the with inside of the SLA. So that's clear for both parties before. And if the individual com uh, customer uh, isn't able and willing to accept under those conditions, then you just have to say you just have to say no. So I think one thing is an important message for everybody in this environment is it's also important to understand your own limitations as well and not just kind of go into any agreement uh any agreement blindly so um yeah yeah excellent thank you very much okay so i mean there are some really interesting questions in slido um actually but i think just in in the interest of time i think we need to keep moving forward so thank you very much to sai um i'm going to introduce um, our third presenter who is mark van der zanden um who um is a technical specialist at surf very experienced in managing large-scale computing and data infrastructures. He's also the EU DAT technical coordinator, as many of you I'm sure are aware. 
um, active in many EOSC related activities and is the EOSC hub representative on the EOSC architecture working group as well. So I'll hand over to you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm um, not sure if you see the slide or you see the presentation mode. We've got presentation mode. Okay, how can I switch? Swap displays. Okay. Yep, that's good. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, within this, uh, this presentation, I want to present a few of the uh, examples in which uh, EODOT has been working to collaborating with a number of communities, which are uh, already many, much uh, distributed across many different countries, uh, and also making use of different uh, service providers within, uh, within EODOT. If you look at that EODOT, what is EODOT providing? Providing in general uh, uh, building blocks towards uh, research communities who can uh, build and up their own uh, research infrastructures on the basis of standardized uh, building blocks. And if you look at this slide, you see that we have different types of building blocks which can be used for a uh, different, kind of, uh, different kind of purposes. Uh, EODOT is an uh, organization is uh, started as uh, from uh, from two different projects, but is currently a legal organization and a partnership agreement, which uh, uh, has uh, 28 different uh, organizations participating across uh, 15 countries within within Europe. Um, if you look at the different services, I'm a little bit annoyed by the diagram. Uh, uh, if you look at the services. Uh, we provide different services, and if you look at how the services are being accessed, uh, um, the users are coming from 110 different uh, countries, uh, and which is spread at different, across the 14 different installations which we uh, provide. And if you look at the, the data which you make available to be defined, this halves the thing across uh, diff 24 different communities from different repositories. So in this case, you can already see that we provide different kinds of services, but we have to provide different services across uh, different uh, borders. And this is a few uh, of the uh, 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 cross-border use cases which we have. This is one of uh, uh, CDataNet. Uh, we participated with them within the CData Cloud, in which we uh, have built up with them uh, and cloud infrastructure on basis of uh, uh, EODOT services, which is spread across five different uh, uh, partners within EODOT, but also five different countries within Europe. But if you look at uh, CDataNet as an organization, it is already an organization which is uh, uh, spread across more uh, uh, across Europe, where uh, 110 different data centers work with them to uh, do the research and analysis. So you can see that this this very highly distributed infrastructure, but also highly different user, uh, different kinds of user domains. So they are not coming from a few countries, but really spread across many different countries. Uh, within ICOS is uh, a, a different kind of use case where we uh, participate with uh, two different parties within uh, uh, within EUDOT, but providing services towards the ICOS as a larger. Uh, organization, which again uh, is already a European organization spread across Europe, providing different services, collecting information from many different uh, stations across Europe. But if you look at this, we set up a smaller uh, uh, use case where uh, one of the sites mostly acts as one of the processing sites and another uh, partner within EUDAT uh, acts as an archiving site where the data is then replicated for, for safekeeping. Uh, the combined use case, if you look at this uh, use case, uh, they uh, generate the data at one of, uh, one of the sites, which is a Signatron, 
uh, but they have the, uh, users uh, located at many different organizations also having access to different kinds of uh, data and computing services where they want to do the analysis. For be able to do this, we collaborated with them to set up an, uh, a B2C replication uh, environment where the data is ingested in one site, the data is automatically replicated at uh, uh, two different other sites where the users are being uh, are given access to the data, where they can do the processing and analysis of the data, but also again can publish uh, the data in another service. But if you look at, at this, it is again that the data is at this time generated at one location, but the users, because the user base is distributed across many different uh, uh, countries, the data has to be replicated across those countries to provide uh, access uh, uh, to the data, but also in combination with the computing uh, resources which are required for the simulations and processing of the data. EPOS, a very similar use case. Um, then I want to go to, to the challenges which we have seen. If you look at that, uh, EWDAT is, is a service organization built out of generic informatic service providers, uh, which are spread across, the, across Europe. But if you uh, look at the, the service providers, they have different mandates. One is the mandate which are given by uh, the national organization because they are a public funded organization. And in the other case, the mandate is provided by uh, their community. And that will set uh, some limitations in providing what kind of services can you provide or what is the amount of services you can provide uh, to, uh, to the users outside of your own uh, mandate. And we have seen that providing services outside of your mandate can be very limiting to a low number of percentage. And if you look at EOSC, it is mainly about providing services out, outside, of your, outside of your mandate. So how do you enable this? How can you provide those services? But also, how can you recover those services, uh, the, the, recover the services and the resources provided to outside of your mandate? One of the other challenges, and I think that is also what uh, Sai already mentioned, all service providers have different kinds of models in uh, developing the cost prices or the prices. And uh, we did some exercise on this to see how can you come to a similar cost model. Uh, and that is, seems to be very challenging. But also, even if you have the same cost model, it does not mean that it will be the same cost or the same price. And also, to prevent that uh, you always go to the cheapest service provider, you need all the kinds of mechanisms to select who is the best service provider for providing services and resources to, uh, to the customer. Um, the, the virtual access model that is already explored within uh, uh, ESCAP. Um, it was not, for me, not the, the best model. It seems to be that it has been approved uh, by differentiating uh, some of the regulations in 2019. So the model, which is an info EOSC 07, is already improved, but it's still not, not perfect. One of the challenges which I see within EOSC is uh, the, the virtual access model is limited. It's only limited to all the services, service instances, which are uh, listed in the project proposals. And it is not uh, uh, open to all services which are currently listed in the EOS marketplace. So if you have onboarded your service into the marketplace, then you still cannot use all the virtual access model because you have to be included one of the project proposals. Um, it is also not really uh, optimal for uh, a cost recovery of services where uh, uh, the users can uh, register themselves or even you do not have to register for those kinds of services because the virtual access model is about, okay, you should be able to demonstrate which is the usage beyond your local, uh, local community or your local customers. How do you want to detect new users for this kind of service? And how is the new users, while well, maybe other users are left and do not, use, make, uh, make, do not make use of the services again. So there you need different kind of uh, uh, detection of what is a new user and how can you show that you have new usage? Another challenge which I also see within uh, uh, virtual access is how do you do cost recovery of 
core services uh, organized by infrastructures. For example, we see near that, we need a number of core services to operate as an e-infrastructure. And it's a very challenging to get cost recovery via virtual access on those kinds of services. Uh, to mitigate one of those, uh, those, those challenges, uh, what we uh, always try to do is to find uh, natural relationships between uh, uh, the customer or the request of the service and the service provider. So it is more a brokering function which we provide uh, within UDAT. We have seen this within uh, uh, the C Data Cloud uh, uh, project. Within, we see this within Combinet, we see that as in EPOS. Uh, and I think, therefore, it is also a natural match because then you can also circumvent that. Uh, the service providers are more closely related with the customer, with the community, therefore they are easily to provide services, resources for those customers. Um, and if we select uh, uh, service providers for providing those services, then uh, the selection is mostly based on affiliation with the community, but also is a direct connection between the requester or the service provider or the community across the countries where uh, the services are being provided. Okay, thank you. If there are any questions, uh, then I will answer them. Thanks very much, Mark. That was really interesting. Um, I think we've got time to fit in one question briefly. Um, so Owen has said in, in Slido, um, are EU DAT cases paid or are they part of project participation? Projects proxy for the complex rules, agreements, mandates needed for cross-border use. Collaboration in projects is great, but I'm not sure it leads easily to potentially paid cross-border resource provision. So perhaps you can comment a little bit in response to that, please. Uh, it, is, it is both ways. Uh, if you look at the Data Cloud uh, that has been uh, built up, to uh, uh, within the uh, CData Cloud project, but the continuation of providing the services is going beyond the project because you do not build up an infrastructure and services just for the just for the project. If you look at the ICOS use case, that is a, a paid service contract uh, made through EUDAT, where uh, uh, CEC and Uli are uh, service providers. So we have an SLA with, uh, with ICOS as organization uh, and overlays uh, between the service providers and UDAT Limited, which is the contract owner of, uh, of this uh, contract. Okay, thanks. I actually see, um, I hadn't spotted this before, but there's, there's a comment um, from Janos Mahaxi in the, uh, the Zoom chat. How do you explain the costs if EOSC principle says free at the point of use? Is that something you can comment on, Mark? Um, I, uh, it strongly depends on, on who, who's going to pay or where is uh, cost recovery. Uh, EOSC is, 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 is focusing on a free at the point of, of use, um, but uh, uh, services are not free, resources are not free, uh, somewhere the cost should be recovered. And I think there, uh, uh, within the Info EOS Code 7, you have the virtual access to do the cost recovery. So you can provide services and resources for free, but somewhere uh, the service providers are being paid. Uh, but as I said, uh, within the Info EOS Code 7, this is limited to uh, the service instances provided within the project proposals. There's not an open model. So I see challenges for providing large amounts of uh, resources for free in general for EOSC if there is no cost recovery possible. Yeah, okay, thank you. And I think that, that leads us probably quite nicely into the panel session anyway. So thank you very much, Mark. That was very interesting. Um, oh. And uh, so we've got half an hour left now uh, for a panel. Um, and you should be able to see now on your screens that we've, um, we've moved or we are moving into um, a poll session on Slido. So um, I've got six panelists here who I'll introduce briefly and we've got some questions that um, will be asked to them but in parallel with that you will be able to see each question as well. So you can see the first one now released as a poll in Slido. So please feel free to um, add your own comments 
in response to that. Um, I'll now introduce the panellists briefly, um, which will be in alphabetical order, since of course they're not actually sitting in a row. Um, so first panellist is Owen Appleton, who's the Service Portfolio Manager at EGI, um, and also deals with the same sort of subject matter in the EOS Hub project. Um, he's been working for a long time in e infrastructure, um, in, previously in EG projects um, whilst at CERN. Um, he has a background in public relations, he's worked as a consultant on policy and exploitation, and he set up a national e-science support network in Switzerland. Um, he was also a co-author of FITSM. Um, that's our first panellist. Second, René Belso, um, who is from uh, Denmark. He's got more than 20 years of experience with research policy and research infrastructure provisioning primarily um, in the area of ICT. Um, I should say, I, I can't necessarily see whether you have or have not switched your video on, but if you are able to switch your video on panelists, then please do so. Um, so Rennie has um, worked in national and international government political institutions. He's been the head of the Danish Centre for Scientific Computing. And he's now working for the National E-Infrastructure Provider Organization um, with a focus mainly on international issues um, around HPC and data management. Um, and he's uh, the Danish member in the EOSC Rules of Participation Working Group currently. Um, thirdly, we have uh, Lena Munari. I'd like to welcome Lena from the European Commission. Um, she's the Deputy Head of uh, Unit C1 in DG Connect, which is the E-Infrastructures and Science Cloud Unit. Um, based in Luxembourg. She's been in the EU institutions for um, 20 years, much of which has been spent in DG Connect, dealing with policy areas um, including cultural heritage, digital libraries, digital preservation, technology enhanced learning. Fourth panellist is Antti Pursula from Finland, who's the Develop Man Development Manager for International Data Services at CSC. Um, he's very experienced in IT infrastructure development, operations and policies. He's currently co-leading Work Package 2 of EOSC Hub, uh, which is strategy and business development. And um, his current role in CSC includes responsibility for development and operations of EU DAT services and managing a portfolio of EOSC related project participations. So welcome, Antti. Um, fifth panellist is Steve Robert Shaw. Um, who's had an involvement in EU research projects since the fourth framework program um, and in national and bilateral international programs for even longer than that. Um, he's got a, a wide experience, so in a sense brings a, a wider perspective to this panel, um, dealing with telecoms, distributed computing, AI, web services and data for many, many years um, with experience in academia, government um, and industry in a variety of different roles. Um, he has involvement in the EOSC through um, a number of small contracts, um, but is familiar with EGI and EU DAT services, as well as um, some of the research infrastructure user communities. Um, and currently he does have a focus on sustainability, so there's, there's quite some relevance in terms of his recent thinking uh, to this panel. Um, fifth, but sorry, sixthly, uh, certainly not least, is Federica Tanlongo. Um, from GAR in Italy, who uh, coordinates the Communications and External Relations Service for GAR. Um, she's been with GAR since 2004 um, and has had involvement in a number of different uh, EU projects. Um, currently, she's creating, um, she's working uh, to create the Italian C Computing and Data Initiative and also in the EOS Pillar project. Um, so EOS Pillar covers Austria, Belgium, France, Italy and Germany, one of the um, 5B projects. Um, so in that project, she's the deputy project manager and she's the leader of their work package four, which is from national initiatives to transnational services. So I think some very good panelists with um, some very relevant and varied experience to offer us. So. Um, Without further ado, I'll enter into the panel. So the first is not actually one question. There's actually two or three questions rolled into one here. I hope you can all see it on your screen. And I think I'll just go through in alphabetical order really for, for the first round at least. Um, what is the incentive for public funders to provide national services across borders? What's the incentive for public service providers to do cross-border provision of resources or services? And what mandate do they have for this? So Owen, if I can turn to you firstly, please. 
Sure. Um, I think for the, for the first part, the answer has to be reciprocity in some ways. Um, for funders to support um, cross-border provision of services, something has to be coming back. But I think how, how that comes back is variable. It could be that money flows out of a country, but it also flows back in and there's some sort of balancing of, of uh, the, as well, like the balance of trade of services to make sure the countries aren't disadvantaged. disadvantaged. Or alternatively, it can just be based on um, reciprocity in terms of mutual benefit. So making sure that if you are essentially subsidizing research in other countries, in some way other countries are subsidizing your research through providing you services that you don't have locally. That's obviously very difficult, but I think that's the only reason that the funding agencies would support it. Um, as to the other part, what's the incentive for the providers? It kind of come down, comes down to the same thing. I think they have to feel like they're getting something out of it. Uh, one problem that I've definitely seen uh, in previous positions is that even if there are parts of, say, a research organization, a university, that are very keen to support the wider research community because they feel engaged with it, they don't necessarily have the organizational mandate to do so outside of, as I suggested in the question to Mark, a project structure, which is always proxied for those mandates. And I think that uh, it, we, there, there is work at a, at a high level, at a policy level, at a funder level, to make sure that the research organizations have some sort of economic model that supports cross-border provision of services and that they then make sure that their organizations, uh, the people within them have the mandate or feel they have the mandate to do that outside of just doing a, doing a project. I know it's much easier to do a project than try and do a public procurement, for instance, in terms of the reaction you would have from your administration. I'll stop there for now. Thanks, Owen. Okay, I'll move on to, to Rene. Well, I think the problem is basically that there aren't any incentives, or at least they're extremely weak. Um, so for, for a public provider, a national infrastructure provider, to send its funding, the funding it has been given by the ministry, to procure, procure uh, in a, one of the other European countries, would basically be to undermine its own services and its own uh, staff's uh, income. So it would be pretty much like asking in the old days, uh, in the industry days where we had like shipping to ask a shipping country like Denmark to build its ships in, in, uh, in Germany. It just will not happen unless Denmark and Germany on a governmental level agree for some level playing fields and agree to open up the market and make this possible. So, so the, the, the answer is there isn't any incentive. And in terms of uh, the other way around, uh, offering something, well, then there's the, the cost recovery. And since there is no business model, there is no possibility to cost recover, uh, it will not happen. And when it does happen, it, it only happens on the experimental uh, level, uh, where uh, it's interesting to maybe share some, uh, some knowledge, maybe expand your network and so on. So uh, when it does happen that there is a cross-border sharing, uh, it's of extremely marginal uh, extent at, well pretty much you can't really say it's happening so it's a business model that's completely lacking yeah yeah okay thanks Rene okay I'll move on to Lena now Lena could you comment please is Lena there Yes. Okay. Sorry, I have an issue because my. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Yes, because my screen is frozen. <laughs> Actually, I can. I, I can all the time see all the participants. Now the humble number of 140. So it actually takes also the one third of my screen. So I was maybe <laughs> switch on my microphone. But anyway, yes. I mean, these are interesting questions. Obviously, from the commission's perspective, we're looking at the, you know, the the virtual access uh, unit cost model has been mentioned. We all know it. Perfect. Uh, obviously, from the, the commission perspective, I think what Vene said uh, and for Owen as well, I think both these cases are valid. I mean, I think uh, the reciprocity is part of the business model. And unless there's a business model, there will not be any reciprocity. So I think from our perspective, EU clearly funds only what is subsidiary to the EU cross-border use. So it is not 
our task or our interest in funding in big uh, chunks those uh, services that are actually funded or at the national level. But clearly, as the EU is all about free flow of uh, everything, uh, if the service provision is not able uh, to flow outside of those silos that are uh, currently uh, in place because of the national infrastructure, that's obviously nobody's fault because it is the way they've been installed, we are not going anywhere. So I, I note also what, what we say about the experimental use, that's very true. I don't think we're anywhere closest to a, a, a proper a business model and the incentives for sharing. And I think this is something that needs to be addressed very quickly. But obviously, Commission is not necessarily the one who is uh, at the central place of this, because I think that the initiative has to happen between the member states, between the major players, and to start building uh, major use cases where this is actually needed, because you need to demonstrate what is the actual need, because you don't just build things for the sake of building them. But, uh, but this just uh, also obviously uh, not, uh, not undermining the fact that, uh, that, that, that the whole of the cross-border use uh, is extremely important because otherwise we can just uh, go all back into our own national silos, our research silos and, 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 and live happily ever after. So uh, this is my comment for, uh, for this. Yeah, thank you, Lena. And I see there are a couple of good comments in the, the chat uh, in Slido. Please keep them coming. Um, I'll move to Antti now. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. So, thank you. Yeah, I can think of uh, several motivations for or incentives for uh, providing services across borders. Uh, I can start from the service provider point of view. So I'm, I'm uh, representing EU DAT and also the CSC center in Finland. So, I mean, the users, the customers, they want services uh, for research is international. The research communities have been going together for a long time to form European research infrastructures, etc. And, and those really need services that are also European, international in that sense. So there you already have one uh, incentive for service providers to answer to this demand. Also the researchers, they want uh, services that are competitive and, and they are good services. They, uh, people are used to commercial cloud providers and, and so on. So I don't think it, it is for a researchers, for a researcher so important if the service comes from the neighboring cloud provider or, or from another country. But of course, then the business model models is, is the different thing. We, we come to that. And I think also for the research funder, uh, we, we see that, that uh, even if the focus is national, I mean, national funders, uh, they also see, I think in many cases, that you need to really support the international research uh, for your country to be competitive in research, they need to have good tools for collaborating, which means interoperability and, and services across countries. Also, if I may add, uh, I think it is a motivation to, to uh, be part of the European ecosystem and, and really support the European research. I mean, we should, we should be European here and, and support uh, each other. Yes, thank you. That's a good point. Um, I'll move next to Steve Robert Shaw. If you could comment, please, Steve. Yes, hello. Um, Hi. I apologise, first of all, that you can't see me. I'm in the UK on a rural internet connection, which means I very rarely am able to supply video streams to anybody. <coughs> so okay, well, at least you're, you're with us in voice, at least. I'm with you in, in spirit and voice, yes. <laughs> Um, so I, I think the, I, I'm, I'm going to slightly turn this question on its head in order to answer it. I hope you don't mind. So the first thing I want to say, and it's been touched on already, is that one of the reasons that the commercial cloud providers succeed is because the users trust that it's always going to be there when they need it, even when occasionally it's not. So one of the reasons in my understanding that um, the e-infrastructures initially and now EOSC is being considered as a, a pan-European service provider to European scientists 
um, and the models that we are considering at the moment is to challenge that attitude amongst users that these facilities, if we can call them that, are project-based and therefore they can't be trusted to always be available even to the scientific community when they're required. So by providing something that is, a, is able to build trust, then users will want to use it and therefore they will put pressure on their national authorities and that is a form of incentive, if you like, coming from the ground up. The problem with that view is that it doesn't take into account the fact that the, um, the, the public funding comes with a political element attached to it. And we can't always rely on politics to play fair and have the same kind of high-minded moral attitudes to European collaboration that we all would agree is a good thing. We have to consider that it has already been demonstrated that some nations are quite capable of withdrawing funding, not only from their own national contributions to international efforts, but also in wanting to actually withdraw from the international efforts themselves. So it comes back to this trust. So the incentive for the national contributions has to be based on building trust, not on collaborate, uh, committing resources or collaborating um, through high-minded ideals. We've got to get some kind of concrete agreements at a high enough level to build the trust and maintain the trust in the services being available whenever the users need them. Thank you very much. Very interesting point. Um, and finally, for this question, I'll turn to Federica. Hi, yeah. thank you. So, um, okay, many of my colleagues uh, uh, stressed the point of the limitations uh, uh, given by the, the fact that some funders are public and they come with uh, this political part attached. Uh, that's, of course, uh, uh, the major problem, in my opinion, to deal with here. And, and it, it also reflects on the second part of the question, the one about service providers, because if they are publicly funded, this gets to, to, the, to this level as well. Uh, so we, in Pillar, we asked this question to ourselves uh, and uh, we, it was part of uh, the survey we did uh, in the country. So we discovered that many publicly funded services do not have, uh, at the moment, access restrictions, uh, which also includes transnational usage. So in a sense, uh, uh, this kind of services uh, and we are talking about, uh, in particular, of services provided by large uh, research infrastructures are already free in point of views. But um, this can be either seen as a byproduct uh, of this, the, the main activity of funding uh, the national level, or as an investment. As uh, Owen at the beginning uh, was, uh, was saying, so uh, you, you are a political uh, organization, you invest where you see that uh, you gain more than you spend. So I believe that while the residual activity can only work to a point, and there may be differences in terms of uh, the percentage uh, uh, a country uh, can allow for these residual resources. And uh, uh, even if at the stage uh, uh, those resources are, uh, uh, let's say, overabundant, when the use uh, uh, will go to full speed, sorry, when the resources uh, will go for speed, for speed uh, they, they 
turn out not to be enough, especially if we are considering uh, the long tail of science uh, and education and industry, and let alone uh, also the, the citizen scientists as likely candidates to use the, these resources. So uh, to me, the only valid incentive to scale up is political willingness to be part and an active one of this wider picture and to understand that if everybody put something on the table, then there would be so much more resources for everybody else. I think this is something you already see in uh, the large scientific collaborations and it doesn't come for free because um, it, came, it came from long-standing uh, negotiations. Thank you very much, Federica. Interesting observations. Um, so I see there are some comments in the, um, the panel in Slido. Thank you. Keep them coming. They're very interesting. Um, I think because we're getting quite short of time, what I'm going to suggest is that we move to the next question, the next, which will be the next poll. Um, and um, rather than just go routinely through the panel uh, members individually, what I'd like to suggest is that the panelists simply um, indicate if they would like to comment, but also I'd like to encourage the audience if they would like to speak. So audience members, you can use the raise your hand function in the Zoom chat. Um, that's not something that's available to all the panelists and presenters because you're all co-hosts. So you will just have to speak out uh, verbally if you wish to, to speak. So um, if anyone would like to, to start off, so the, the question here is, how should funding flow to providers for them to make their services available across borders? So who'd like to kick off then? Hmm, I could. Okay, I could say that the possibility for, for, na for national protectionism has to be removed. I mean, it's no different than other European issues that we have had the last 50 years. So as long as you can protect your, your, your home service, and there is no business model across borders, it just won't happen. Absolutely um, agree. So, so, yeah, so I mean, it, it's like if, if we keep avoiding to getting into the, to the actual way to move the money, we just won't get nowhere. Thanks, Rennie. Okay, was that Steve who commented? Did you want to say anything it more, was, Steve? It was, yes, yes. Um, I, I want to support that point of view. And also, um, we have to consider what the likely impact is of the current situation that we're all living through. Um, we could all remember the financial crisis that took place 10 or 12 years ago and the impact that that had on various economies. And we have to ask questions about how willing political entities are going to be to carry on funding various international activities when we are um, really up against the, uh, the budget limits on being unable to fund national activities. Thanks, Steve. Um, so if other panelists want to comment, um, in the meantime, I can see, Sean, that you're commenting in the chat. If you would rather just pose your question verbally, just raise your hand if you'd like to, but um, I'll stick with the panelists for the moment. Would any of the other panelists like to, to continue with this? Uh, can I say something? This is Nina. Um, well, I think uh, one of the issues here is, you know, somebody mentioned um, in the presentation about the cumbersome way of when you're trying to deal with this uh, through projects, that there's, you know, all these uh, service level agreements that are already in place, but, you know, they have to be put in. So my question here is that if you want this to be supported at the UK level, uh, somebody already mentioned the broker infrastructure. So is, would, would, I would like to, to hear from the, the panelists as well that would that be something? I mean, clearly you need to see which are the services available and why would they be, uh, why would somebody uh, sort of want to provide that and what is the added value of providing that over the border? Uh, and then probably, you know, with a broker infrastructure, have some sort of a credit mechanism that you could actually apply. I don't know, these are just ideas, but I mean, obviously from the commission point of view, it's becoming more and more important particularly because uh, funding EOSC and EOSC-related activities from individual projects is sort of 
coming a little bit to the end of its uh, day, I think, because you cannot, car, you know, for forever keep on uh, supporting infrastructure from individual projects. But uh, if anybody has good ideas of how this could be also channeled through the, the, the EU projects, uh, whether it's a broker infrastructure or something like this, uh, I'll be very, very happy to hear. Thanks, Lena. And I see there's a comment here in Slido, labelling services just as free at the point of use is not sufficient. Um, and also either allow the money to follow the scientists or at least allow funding to scale with active users. Um, I would very much support that. That sounds like that's what needs to be done. Okay. Just yeah. um, I have a comment there if it's okay, Rene. I, I, I agree. But there are complexities to having a token mechanism. One of the main ones is maintaining your service ready to use if you're unsure of what's the volume of use you're going to generate and therefore the funding you're going to get. Um, you need to be able to have some baseline certainty that you can keep the service there and justifying keeping resources, particularly if we're not just talking about machines, if you're talking about human expertise to make those machines useful. How do, do I have to keep basically idle consultants there ready to serve uh, an unknown pool, uh, an unknown demand pool. Uh, I think there are some ways we could deal with this. One of them is by making it very easy to purchase these resources, probably like you say, maybe with a token. Um, I think one idea might be just to say that for certain classes of research projects, perhaps nationally as well as at European scale, some small percentage of your budget can be used to purchase EOSC. Uh, you ask approved services that are in some approved register without having to change your budget, without having to justify it or go through a procurement. Because you can't always foresee the use you're going to have, but if you knew that on your ERC grant or your Marie Curie grant, you could spend 4% on, on, on these services and you could really only spend it on that, you'd be looking around for the good services to use to support you. But I think you need some semi-artificial means to maintain enough volume through this system to keep the services there. Otherwise, everything other than bare metal, I think, wouldn't really, wouldn't survive. Thanks, Owen. I think, I think uh, Antti wanted to comment, I saw. Did you still want to speak, Antti? Um, I think Owen actually covered this. I, I just uh, wanted to uh, bring into the discussion of this uh, kind of a mutual benefit for, for national funders that the, indeed some kind of a brokering system or, or a, even a joint pot of funding for international usage might come into question that, uh, that, that if, if uh, the national funder can kind of uh, be assured that, that they will get the same amount of benefit from other, other funders for their users. I think the Nordic countries uh, have tried something like that as, as was presented in the first presentation today. Mm -hmm. uh, this I, I think could be, I mean, one, at least in theory, one option. Mm -hmm. Some kind of a joint pot of funding, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, we're getting very short of time, so I suggest we move on to the next question. Um, um, Deida, can I make a small, very small comment? <laughs> certainly. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I think that, uh, well, for one thing, the, um, the money following uh, uh, the user side, the user science uh, uh, shouldn't be the only the only criteria because uh, uh, you, you may have uh, uh, some uh, disciplines uh, which are sort of uh, uh, nice but still uh, very useful and very rewarding in terms of results so the size of your audience uh, uh, can't be the only criteria but could be one. And the other thing uh, is that, in my opinion, uh, we should also take in consideration forms of funding that, that are not actually money and uh, work on uh, harmonizing them. Because uh, at this stage, uh, what we see is that uh, there is quite a lot of things that are funded uh, uh, through in-kind uh, mechanisms in the countries. You can see this again uh, in the research infrastructures. But then uh, you have to agree on uh, how to define this in, this in kind. And I think it is really important because uh, there are a lot of uh, countries and uh, 
we do count in different ways. Mm. Thank you. Okay, so we're nearly out of time. Um, I think we, we can overrun a little bit. I've been given permission. <laughs> so those of you who wish to stay, please, please feel free to do so, because actually the next session doesn't start for another um, half an hour or so. Um, so we'll spend a few more minutes um, with your agreement um, silently. Um, so the, the next question is, what is the overhead on cross-border provision or consumption of resources in terms of procurement rule, contracts, SLAs, and so on and so forth? Um, so where are, you know, where are the complications and costs coming in um, in terms of time and effort and, and money? Um, so I think I'll, I'll suggest that we, we run this the same way as the previous ones. So just panellists, if you would like to comment, please just say so. And anyone in the audience who wishes to contribute verbally, just, just raise your hand uh, in the Zoom panel. Um, and of course, you can type your comments into Slido. So panellists, who would like to start with this one? Can, I can start. If, so, Ante here. So, I, I just starting to discuss. So, one thing is that at the moment that you will make a contract with your user, then then you have this overhead. I don't really see that there is so much difference if if the user is from from your local user community or from outside. As soon as you need to go into the contracting process, uh, there is an overhead. Okay, maybe some technical uh, dif difficulties in, in uh, signing papers or something like that. But the principle, it is the same. You need to have SLAs and you need to have uh, uh, definitions of, of your service. Um, and, and then another point is that the service providers should also make the provision of services easy in this way or contracting for services. If we, if we are thinking of paper paper use, but I think we heard examples from EU that and also EGI that how how this can be done with the central uh, representative, so that the services can be contracted from one organization instead of a, of a different nodes of a federation. Thank Thanks, Antti. Okay, anyone else want to comment? Yeah, I uh -oh. would agree. There is no extra overhead. It, is, it doesn't matter if the users from one country or the other. Of course, it matters if there are more users, there are maybe more costs, maybe not. But where the user comes from, it doesn't matter. As long as there is a payment for the service. Well, it, I don't have the hand raised function because I was a co-host, but if I could jump in here for two seconds. Yeah, please um, do. So there's two points here. One is procurement is very, very different than just having a, a contract or an SLA. I mean, SLAs, you just come up with a template that you can get agreed between the, the two people and, and off you go, where procurement can get very, very complicated. And we, we are already starting to see that with, with OCRE and a number of different frameworks that are, that are being discussed. So I would, separate, I would separate out the two. And the second point about... Um, SLAs and contracts and stuff and OLAs and all that kind of stuff actually is we, we are finding to be there is quite a bit of overhead when you start to scale out. So for an example, if you have 10 or 12 different pilots with inside of a project that need 10 uh, or 12 different uh, SLAs and then you have four or five different providers on the back end that you need to have OLAs with, you, you find yourself not being able to keep up with the amount of requests that are coming in and stuff. So you do need to like, let's say improve the automation and to, in order to reduce the overhead, which is, it's always just opening up a word document just to replace some key words across the template and closing and all that kind of stuff takes way more hours than people can appreciate. So I think when you get into scalability, you will need some type of, let's say, technical service or solution to help you be able to deal with that. But if you're doing one every six months, yeah, of course there's, there's little, little overhead. So that was my two points. Thanks, Sai. Um, I see that Paul Rouse from Geant has raised his hand. Paul, please go ahead. Thanks, Dale. Hello, everyone. Uh, I suppose, first of all, it's a bit of a sales pitch in the first instance that tomorrow is part of the ESC Hub uh, session. We've got a, a slot there on business models and procurement where there'll be quite a bit of discussion around this point. So uh, 
rather than take up time now when we're very time constrained, I just encourage attendees if they're particularly interested in this point to uh, perhaps come along tomorrow and uh, hear what myself and, and colleagues who've looked into this matter are going to cover and present. But of course, you've got two sides to that. You've got both the, the selling activity. Uh, if you're a public body, are you actually entitled, capable of selling? What systems, enterprises do you have to support perhaps complexity of billing and invoicing, metering of services, uh, depending on how you intend to recover your costs uh, and also what liabilities has, has been touched upon earlier. And then I think as people have already raised here, um, as you move into a more uh, comprehensive and mission critical consumption of resources in order to conduct your science, then the more diligent you probably want to be in your buying process, whether that's dictated by legal obligations to carry out a full OGU procurement or having certainty about data ownership rights, uh, ensuring all of the FAIR principles are in place, SLAs are there uh, to ensure that you can deliver your mission. Um, that's quite an undertaking in itself. Um, so there's certainly some opportunities in the EOS model in the future is if uh, through what's been positioned in some of the working papers of the sustainability working group is this concept of EOSC exchange if that centre of expertise role can exist to help soften or remove that burden for many uh, and also in part if funding could be corralled to deliver on the ambition of free at the point of use. There's a lot of things there um, many of those triggers will start a whole conversation themselves um, let's, let us tell you a bit more about those tomorrow but of course this uh, the EOS project is a is a is a big monster, um, and, it, and we have to take bites of this in, in many different places. But uh, yeah, they're, they're they're very significant considerations. Yep. Thanks, Paul. Good comments. Thank you. Anyone else want to make some more comments? I have a comment. Um, I think the interesting thing about the question here is what's the overhead. Um, and I, there are a few different things that determine that overhead, some of which Paul had mentioned. Um, VAT, which is mentioned in the slide, is an interesting one. But I think also you have to consider how many parties are there to the agreements. So if it's bilateral, these things aren't, as Renee said, fundamentally any different to something that's within one country. When they're multilateral, they become much more complicated, whatever countries are involved. And that's when you really benefit from having some central broker or framework contract that allows you to minimize that overhead. And related to that, I think the overhead is also related to how big the, the purchase or the use of resources is. Um, it may be that we find that cross-border procurement, cross-border provision only works for very large scale sales or purchases because then the, the relatively more fixed overhead is kind of diluted among them. The sad thing is that that would then discourage smaller, more niche services, which might include technology and infrastructure and human efforts, where the uh, each sale may be relatively small, which makes the overhead on them incredibly high because they still require an SLA, maybe not a procurement, but they require contracts to be agreed, money to be moved around, things like that. So I think we have to think about what kind of services we want to support, and I hope that it's not just large-scale procurement of say bulk computing resources because I think there is more than that that we can benefit from as a community. Thanks very much Owen. Okay. Yep, thanks Federica, please go. Uh, yeah, another point uh, I'd like to make is that in some countries uh, in order to to, to be eligible uh, to be bought uh, by public institutions, uh, your service uh, must be uh, enrolled in some kind of, uh, or accredited uh, in some kind of marketplace, public marketplace. So in, for instance, uh, in Italy, uh, there are some limitations for uh, universities uh, or, uh, or other uh, institutions to just go and buy uh, other services outside uh, this marketplace. Um, so if this is the case, uh, this is part of the overhead because uh, uh, you should uh, get accredited uh, in multiple countries. And I, I don't know uh, how many countries do for this, but this could be huge if everyone has something like that. 
So if you want to provide a service uh, transnationally, potentially you have to, you, you have to get accredited uh, in all the, the separate countries of the stage. So maybe also considering uh, a European level uh, accreditation is something we should think of. I, I think it's clear that um, EOSC is in a position where it's starting to have to transition between thinking about itself as um, a project or a series of projects and starting to consider itself a business. Um, none of the problems that we've discussed so far are unusual or unsolvable in a business context. Overheads are overheads, they're a reality. Um, I, I think what, what, what's starting to um, emerge is that, for, from my point of view, in terms of project funding, some kind of funding is still going to be required and maybe it needs to be thought of in, in the same way that a business would consider investment. So the investment is put in in order to help EOSC build up its portfolio of services and support them. Um, don't forget that Amazon ran for over a decade uh, at a considerable loss before it started making any money at all. And now it's, um, you know, it's close to eating the world. So the, the, there is um, one of the earlier questions was what is the incentive? <coughs> Excuse me. Well, the incentive is through um, investment in real services that are demanded by real users there will eventually be some mechanism that is able to support itself and possibly even return some of, of the of the investment through some mechanism we haven't discussed yet but it, it's not none of the problems that we're discussing are unsolvable in a business context so maybe the the, the solution that we're looking for is to start thinking of EOSC as a business or in a business-like manner. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Steve. Right, we're getting very short of time, but I can see, Lena, you've got your microphone open. Was it because you wanted yes, to- Yes, sorry, I have comments? it on all okay. the time because I told her that, you know, otherwise I can't switch it off, off, off again. <laughs> okay, so it is on, but I tried to be quiet. So I have to keep it on because I'm not sure if I can switch it on. Okay, but if um, I, well, I can give the last word to you just now if you want to make a brief comment. Yeah, no, I think I think these are all very interesting considerations. I think what the previous speaker just said about the EOSC as a business, okay. I think it's, uh, I, I was thinking of the same thing. I mean, if you look at the, the, the current platforms, you know, they, they have been able to solve all these um, problems. You know, I live in Luxembourg, which is the e-commerce hub of, uh, of Europe because the VAT is the lowest here. It's very simple to see why all the, all the world companies that operate in European soil are providing uh, the e-commerce services or buying all the procurement as well in, in Luxembourg. But this is, uh, but this is a country-specific thing for Luxembourg. I think in the same way, maybe we should think in EOSC in terms of, of, of specialization, like who does what better? Do we have, who, who does what and who does it best? Uh, do we have an overview of this? Uh, do we know which services are best provided in a certain way by their certain entities and, and maybe there is a case then to showcase like why do we all produce this if there is somebody who can do it better and cheaper and quicker and can specialize on this. Uh, this is one point. Then another thing I was thinking is that is, uh, in general uh, when, we, when we look at EOS and its, uh, and its, and its um, development, I think one of the speakers said it, has said it already in the very early in this discussion, is that uh, when people say that they, something is not possible, it usually means that there's no political will to do so. So I think we have to actually be very realistic as well. Uh, the choices of countries and the choices of, of, of different kind of mechanisms that are being put in place are not often based only on rational choice. So that's why uh, the scenario that I was advocating might not be possible, but I think uh, we must be striving somewhere closer to transparency so that it becomes evident that it's not worth providing the same service in 27 times or 25 times, whatever the number would be, and, uh, and, and start, start to think in this way. I mean, uh, but obviously there are all kind of uh, political hurdles that before we get there, but uh, if, if we don't take this as an objective, it will also happen. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're going to have to wrap up there. Um, we don't want everyone else to eat all the biscuits in the lobby after all.
um, and we are quite late. Um, so I think it remains for me to, to thank everybody, um, our three presenters, our six panellists, um, and you in the audience for your contributions and participation. Thank you very much. I hope you found it worthwhile. Um, thank you for attending. And I'm going to just very briefly hand over to Sarah now with a quick housekeeping message. Thank you very much, Dale, and thanks to you for, for having managed this session. I just wanted to tell the people in this room that the next session in this room will be the service onboarding and catalogue of services. So if you were planning to attend this session, you are in the right room. If not, you have the links linked to the agenda or in your email from yesterday or here on the slide. Okay, have a nice break. So the next session starts in 15 minutes or maybe Owen can think about uh, every five extra minutes <laughs> for the break. <laughs> Leave it up to oh. you, Owen. <laughs> we can start a few minutes later, it's okay. Bye-bye. <laughs>